Well, we call it the January jump. It's been an extraordinary start to 2023 on the markets uh, in the United States in particular. But just of late, we've had financial results from some of the big tech companies that suggest maybe things were overdone. We'll find out all about this from David Bacher of Corian in our monthly update on the markets and how they performed. David, January jump, I guess uh, there, there are many other ways that you could describe it, but it's been a while since we've seen such a rocketing in share prices in the start of the year. Can you put it in context for us? Thanks, Alex. Yes, indeed. Uh, equity market returns in January were, as you said, strongly positive um, and reverse December's decline. The MSL World Index, for example, posted a 7% return, and most other markets you know, also posted compelling returns. Emerging markets, for example, were up 8%, and in South Africa, we followed those global trends, ignoring the Eskom fiasco, and local equities were up a, a similar amount. So, you know, in terms of starts of the year, we've got data going back to 1960. This was the ninth best January, um, so it's nine out of, uh, I think it's 63 data points, so it was extremely strong, but I think uh, some distance still from a, a record breaker. So let's just put that into some kind of perspective. If you were to say how the world looks, I'm sure that of those 63 data points, it's not the ninth best time uh, in, in that period. The world's looking very dodgy at the moment. Interest rates going up, inflation is high. Ukraine-Russia war seems to now be going into an even higher level with the Russians throwing something like 500,000 troops at it. That's the, the latest data that we get. So why? Why would we have had such a big rebound in January if the macros aren't looking that great? Look, it's a, it's a bit of a disconnect for us too, um, but I think the biggest factor in terms of what how the market is reacting has definitely been the changing and lowering of inflation expectations and in turn the market expecting that we're near the end of the rate increases. Effectively the rally I think reflects optimism that the Fed will prevail in its efforts to to tame inflation and cut in interest rates and and guard the economy towards a, a more softer landing. So you know, if you have to rewind the clock a few months ago uh, a lot of market commentators were expecting a hard landing. That seems to have changed. So once again, it's really driven by you know the Fed driving market prices, and and that's been in our interpretation the reason behind what has been a, a very strong rally. So stand aside for a moment and have a look at this in the context of where share prices are at uh, as we look at them right now. And is this the beginning of a whole new bull market or is it a, another sucker rally and generally a bear market? And I ask this because I've got this, this, uh, this little, I'll just show it to you. It's a wonderful little statue that was given to me with a bull and a bear. And if, if you, if at the, I've got the bear on top, just to remind me that we're in a bear market. But actually, some people might be saying, hmm, this is the way it should be, Mr. Hogg. Help us out. Uh, interesting uh, and you know difficult question to answer. I can give you our view, Corian, and and we certainly in the camp that the market has got ahead of itself. Uh, you know the Fed driven rally has has been despite a rather hawkish rhetoric by Jerome Powell. I mean he literally said the job isn't done, and he, he went on further to say if the economy evolves in the way we think, we don't see rate cuts in 2023 but the market is almost calling his bluff so you know we think that at the very least the market rally has you know priced in aggressive interest rates cuts coming quicker there, there than expected so you know to answer a question is this the start of a, a more sustained uh, bull market i think you've got to break that down in terms of which geographies and which asset classes from a current perspective when we're very much a valuation driven house we think that you know offshore equity, specifically the U.S., you know, has rallied quite strongly, and we would actually be taking some money off the table um, and using this as an opportunity to to cut back a bit. We have a different view on South Africa. I know South Africa has its problems, 
But from a valuation perspective, you have shares and stocks that are still trading at six, seven dividend yields. So there is some opportunities in equities. But globally, you know, taking into account that America forms sixty percent of global equity markets, we would be using this opportunity to 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 take some risk off the table. I'm so pleased to hear that, David, because in our business portfolio this week, we kind of picked up from people like you and our other informal, I call you our informal panel of experts, and we listen to what you have to say and shape our proposed uh, model portfolio accordingly. And we took the opportunity to take quite a lot of uh, of profit from the uh, big tech st- stocks. Now, if you'd said, uh, no, they're on their way to the moon, I guess I would have felt a little bit uncomfortable. But why do you say that? Why do you say uh, that this could be what we've called a, a sucker rally? I think it just points back to to taking into account the market valuations relative to history. So, you know, we run data going back for some time. In terms of the US market, you know, it's at valuations still much higher than its long term average. And if you square that against how you started the interview, that the world still has problems, there's still inflation, we still got lots of debt in the system. You know, we can't square that up quite, quite, quite comfortably. So we still think that there's still headwinds in the face of consumers, and that is not really reflected in market valuations. Have you done anything? I told you about our business portfolios. Have you done anything in your portfolios at Corian? Were you playing with real money, not play play money like we are? Uh, did you make any changes as a consequence of what you saw in January? Definitely. I mean, we've just come out of our asset allocation meeting, and and as I said earlier, uh, we're still quite favourable South African equities. So we have done very little uh, realigning there, but we have used this opportunity over the last couple of days to to cut back more on our US exposure um, as opposed to to global equities. I think other equities such as emerging markets, European equities, you know, that uh, valuations aren't um, as stretched as, as the US. So, you know, focus from a Korean perspective is cut back on US equity exposure. We've uh, got a, a, an ETF that tracks Japan largely because Sean Pesh said it's offering excellent value. Does that also come into your uh, scenario uh, and, and uh, when you do your compilation of your portfolios? Absolutely. I mean, we look at all major regions and asset classes, and Japan is, is definitely one of those. Uh, the yen's having a mass rally over the last three months, and valuations from a Japan perspective it is is quite appealing. So we are slightly overweight Japan. I wish we were more overweight Japan, as Sean has been. Uh, you know, Japan has its unique uh, circumstances as well. There's lots of companies and lazy balance sheets and, and to some extent some zombie companies. But if you have a right stock picker, which, you know, I think Sean is one of those, uh, I think that is a good place to be hunting. How far are the markets still off? Be highs. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to reflect. You know, it was, I think, six months ago when Fed chairman warned that interest rates will bring a lot of pain. And you fast forward to to today, and it's clear that interest rates has worked and to bring down inflation, but it hasn't been really the pain we were expecting in the stock market. So the S and P uh, is yeah approximately sixty percent higher than its lows. But still, you know, fourteen percent probably below its all-time high. It's very different from a local perspective, where we're pretty much back to to our record highs. So, you know, South Africa, from a relative basis, has been not a bad investment destination. And South Africa, you said that you're not changing your view on this market. We do know that the Johannesburg stock is changed. It's really two markets in one: the resources and the SA Inc market. Can you break that down for us on those two areas? I think we're pretty much having similar valuations and opportunities across across all the sectors. I think, you know, as, as from our, what we're seeing in front of us, broad, the broad market is actually offering, offering value. So uh, for once, uh, we actually you know, not taking so much sector bets. Uh, in other words, being overweight a particular uh, industrials, so is this financials or, or resources? 
Uh, we're pretty much buying into that South Africa is relative to emerging markets and, and domestic uh, developed markets offering broad value. Let's just dig down a little into the individual funds. Which ones of them did best in January? So, yeah, so if you actually break down what happened in January in a local perspective, yeah, actually had some huge discrepancies in terms of market caps. So large caps rallied 10%, but small caps only rallied 2%. And I think that's typical of a sudden risk on move where, where investors, you know, move quite quickly into the more liquid shares. So given how large cap shares ran, it was the large cap focused funds that really outperformed last month. And, you know, the funds that track a Aussie 40 uh, benchmark or RAFI benchmark, which has exposure to not just large caps, but also to like shares such as NASPAS, which rebounded strongly last last month, all came to the top of the tables. The Christian Core All Share Equity Fund, the Coronation Equity Fund did really well, or Mutual RAFI 40, they were all on the top of the leaderboard. No surprise, large caps runs, NASPAS runs, those are the kind of funds that you would expect to see at the top of the, the rankings. And the worst? The worst funds were the funds that were, you know, not capturing that market beta. Uh, they were really more stock picking funds that were looking at mid, small uh, and pledging shares. So those shares that actually had quite a good 2022, you know, bore the brunt of, of this rally. But, you know, a, a month is nice to look at and see trends, but uh, certainly not a, a, a format to make long term investment decisions. It also emphasizes to you or illustrates to you surely that by staying out of the market, you can miss these rallies. If you're invested and you know why you're invested in certain things, sometimes you just need a bit of patience. 100%. I think we had this discussion a few months ago where, you know, the phrase time in the market is much more important than timing the market. And you must re remember that over the long term, equity markets go up. So you could have a very, very strong reason to be underweight, an asset class that rewards you over the long term. We had Magnus Haystick uh, laying into the property sector in the past week, explaining that had you bought property at any time since 2017, when he decided to get it completely out of all of his clients' portfolios at Brenthurst Wealth, that you would have lost money. I, I understand where Magnus is coming from, and it's more of a macro political view. But if you see something going down at some point in time, like South African industrial shares, it has to become value. Are you seeing any of that in property yet? I think we we agree with the thesis. A, a you know the difference. I think uh, I might be speaking out of turn between ourselves and Magnus is that you know Magnus takes a very big picture of the macro environment and trends and he, he's largely got that right over the last 10 years to five years uh, he's caught it early and been quite vocal uh, and hats off to him but where we do disagree is your latter point about you know bad environment or bad company sometimes can be a good investment because everything is priced at a point and you know we know property experts in terms of residential commercial that's not where we play but just broadly speaking uh yeah, prices sometimes overshoot on the upside, but also on the downside. So, you know, I, I think you, you've got to take into account where property prices have come from and in which region you are. And I know Joburg has particularly borne the brunt of, of a depressed property market on the residential side. But at a point in time, it will offer value. And, and who's used to say we're not, we're not close to that. Indeed. Okay, David, give me a five year view. If you were to put money away today, would you first of all go with, uh, let's start with a pit versus Magnus uh, onshore versus offshore uh, challenge, which we are. We have got a million rand challenge going there. At the moment, pit is way ahead. It's only a year in, though, 20% of the time in. Would you be going onshore or offshore for the next five years? I don't know if I'm trying to get out of that question, but I'm going to wiggle a little bit. Um, if the question was, will I be onshore versus offshore in the US, I'll definitely go onshore. If it was a little bit more detailed and nuanced, will I go 
local versus emerging markets in Europe, I would say it's a close call. So if you were to take your five uh, uh, five year view today, what fund would you put your money into and, and why? So I think you're going to be mindful of the risk you're taking uh, and what you're trying to achieve. But if I had to stick you know, our neck out and say, okay, what in the great has the greatest probability of being the best performing equity fund over the next five years in South Africa? Um, I would try and you know filter that question by selecting a fund that takes on risks as high, high conviction. That's a, as you know, a fund manager that is aligned to our market view at Corian, a fund manager that we respect and has experience. It's a good stock picker. And probably for those reasons, I would pick a 91 value fund managed by the experienced John Bickard. Um, he's had a, a reasonably tough year, but I think he's got strong credentials. It comes with a lot of volatility, volatility and risks, but you know it may be worth the ride. John Bickard has been the reason why we invested in Tiger Brands in our a biz news portfolio and my goodness that has really performed very well so he's a guy with a he can spot them uh, he's had a few that have hurt him and led him down quite badly uh, in the past year but i guess that's what happens when you are taking individual stocks i know marion roberts is one of his favorites and that's been an absolute disaster correct and i think that's investing i mean you, you're not going to get them all right, and you'll be an extremely good investor if you get 65% of your calls right. You, you take risks to get returns, and think, and investing is about probabilities. Uh, you know, it's a it's a very humbling game, and, and a fund like you know a deep value fund will have hiccups, it will have hurdles, but it will have winners. And if you believe in the strategy over time, those winners tend to outperform the the hurdles and the missteps. And you know that a guy like Bickard has been around the block more than once and uh, will be going around the block a long time into the future. David, just to, to close off with, we, we talk every month about the Korean report, and it's, it's very valuable in that you have a look at what's happened in the past month. So you, you, you can pick up not having to do the day-to-day -day, uh, following, and actually it's, 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 a very, it's a much more sensible way to follow your investment portfolio than to look at it on a daily basis when you can get knocked from side to side. But in Davos, they have a PWC chief executive survey. And what they've done for the last 26 years is PricewaterhouseCoopers has gone around the world and interviewed chief executives. And then they take the information and compile it into an index of sort. Now, last year, 2022, the chief executives of major corporates around the world were the most optimistic ever in those 26 years. This year, 2023, they are the most pessimistic ever. So if you can imagine, you've got an outlier at the one end and another one at the other end in two years, the two most recent years of the 26. Are we likely to see that kind of volatility as well in the market? In other words, we've had a fantastic month in January. Is it is it uh, in the in the wind perhaps that maybe next next month February will say, oh my goodness, we've had one of the worst months, and so on and so forth? Or how are you going to how are you reading the way that twenty twenty three is going to play out? Our views expect lots more volatility. You can just see it in terms of you know Jerome Powell's speaks on and tells the market one thing and the market is actually calling his bluff and saying no you're saying that because you want to be hawkish and warn people but we believe you you're not going to do that at all so you know there's a big divergence between you know central bankers trying to guide the market and what the market's expecting something's got to give in that kind of environment where investors are are taking a big view on on, on second guessing the 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 reserve bank creates volatility, creates opportunities, but also creates risk. Fascinating. Look forward to February already. David Bacher is with Corian, and uh, we discuss every month the Corian report. I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com.